Yeah, all right, okay, so, uh, so yeah, so I wasn't joking earlier when I said there's, there's not going to be any pair work or discussion, I'm just, I'm just no. going to talk to you about stuff. So you don't have to do anything, just relax. Oh. <laughs> yes. Not my oh. Maybe you can, but you can interrupt me at any point to ask any questions you want, or anyone else, okay? So, uh, basically, um, I about a year and a half ago at the IXWO DOS conference, Guy Cook talked about translation, which has led to the book, which we've now all got, haven't we? No, I wouldn't use it. Okay, well, if you went to his talk on Saturday, then you, you got this new book, Translation in the Language Classroom. And, uh, and so I saw that talk about 18 months ago, and then last week, or the week before that, I finally got around to actually doing some. Uh, although that's not entirely true. Um, but uh, well, more about that later. So basically, it's been a bit of an anathema to use any sort of translation in the classroom. Or we've, okay, what? so it's, uh, it's been something that we've been really told not to do. Students shouldn't use their L1 and, uh, in the classroom, and we shouldn't. Uh, they would encourage them not to use bilingual dictionaries and all this sort of st stuff. Okay, and uh, certainly don't let them use their L1 in the classroom. And, you know, because it's a community. Does that ring any bells for you, or are you yeah, quite relaxed? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so he talks about this. And what the first thing he says is that there's no scientific evidence whatsoever anywhere, and he splits into it, but says, um, that there's any one approach is better than any of the others. So the communicative approach or grammar translation, they're all, people have learned from these through the years, and they've all been, you know, successful. It depends on the learner, doesn't it? Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, so yeah, so why, why is this the case? Why have we sort of been so dogmatically against translation? And he says the reasons are basically political and commercial. Um, and he says, you know, like back, if, you know, when, when course books were being published, if you had to actually write a course book um, for each different language, that would have cost much more money than just doing one that's just all in English. Um, so that would be a commercial interest. And sort of, I guess it's not really political, but you know, like the fact that teachers, very often English people, don't speak the other other people's languages, mm. uh, so they made it this sort of this rule that it's better if you learn you know, full immersion. Uh, they made it up, basically. Yeah, but not us, not us. <laughs> but people like you know, from 150 years back, have sort of been saying the same thing. Um, and the, the, but he's saying that if you look for any sort of evidence, there isn't any. It doesn't exist. So you can challenge Guy Cook about that, and he'll just tell you, yeah. You know, so, um, why use translation? Okay, uh, well, in our experiments, um, the one thing that came up above all else was the first thing everyone said was it was really, really engaged. The students were really engaged. And in fact, today, I was asking my students, what do you want to do next? Because I was feeling a bit uninspired. And one of them actually said, um, can we please do some more translation? Which is lovely that it happened just an hour ago. Uh, the other point he makes is that it's natural. It's the most natural thing in the world, they're doing it anyway. They're all going to go home and look in their dictionary if you don't let them in the classroom, and they're all doing it all the time in their heads. So why are we fighting it? Not that say you are. It avoids avoidance. So students need to get around the bits of language by you, you know, just if you don't know the subjunctive in Spanish, you can always sort of walk, you know, get around it by just sort of using more words and explaining. And if they do an activity where they actually have to translate something, they have to deal with that structure. Um, and uh, raises awareness of differences in form. They could just say, oh, look, the syntax is different in my language to yours. Raises awareness of difference, differences in English synonyms. So this is something that's come up when they say, well, can I use this word to translate from my language into English? And you say, well, yeah, but it's not quite the same. You know, and so these discussions come up. How is that different? Um, Perhaps that will be made clearer later when we look at some of the examples that came up in the three lessons that we're going to talk about. Um, rather than, so one of the arguments against translation was that apparently the, 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 the opposite is true, that it doesn't show you like it can, it can perpetuate sort of false friends in language, uh, but in fact it, apparently he reckons that it reveals them much more, it makes them really clear to, to see when um, students have misunderstood. And his example, Guy Cook's example, was with the word sympathique, 
in Italian or French. And, and Spanish, simpatico, yeah, and that they, we all think it's sympathetic and it's not, it's something else. And so when they use it, when they're translating, you'd find that out. But they could, in fact, use it in English. Oh, he's very sympathetic, and you wouldn't necessarily know that they were wrong. Yeah? Because the okay. before was correct. Anyway, that's his example. Uh, makes meaning, meaning easy. They, tr they translate it from their language into whatever they think. And you say, oh, yeah, what we say is, you know, we reformulate it. We don't have to do with meaning, which is always a relief. And um, yeah, Guy Kukowitz also talks about it being a fifth skill. That translating, or in interpreting, he doesn't seem to distinguish, but between translating, it is actually something that we do. You know, uh, um, as, as a sort of a, a real skill in life, you know, it's almost like, can you tell me what this means, or can you translate this letter? changes it made to my clock when I went back a year and a half ago was that I first of all relaxed about the use of first language, started letting them do it, and this I found, up, uh, and bilingual dictionaries as well, and dictionaries, you know, so I just thought, oh, well, let's be relaxed about that, and that's pretty much the only change I made. Um, and this was really consolidated for me as becoming a, a, a self trainer. Because when I was sitting at the back of the class and able to listen to the students while the teacher was actually speaking, <laughs> God, they were actually speaking at the same time as the teacher, it was really bad. I found that they very, very, very rarely were off topic. They were, they were always talking about the class, what the teacher had just said, the instruction had given, the language that was just being taught. And so I sort of thought, well, actually, yeah, if they're actually talking to each other in their own language, it's probably about the lesson anyway. Let's just relax about it. So I just became a bit more relaxed. Um, I think that's, yeah. Okay, now, moving on to more sort of practical of it, there's, but you can use translation activities to focus just on form. And I think he's suggesting in the book that really we should go for meaning, we should focus on meaning, and then form will become part of that. Right? So there, but there are different types of um, translation activities, and again, I think we should all read the book, because um, <laughs> 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 well, we've all got it for free, haven't we? There's copies all around the school. So the, the thing was, is I thought, okay, why didn't I use it anymore? Why didn't I just relax about it while in the classroom? Why didn't I actually start translating it? The problem is that we are in multilingual classrooms. And so it's not so easy, is it? I don't know all their languages. And I didn't. But then I discovered TED Talks recently. And the great thing about TED Talks is that they're... The, some of the transcripts are um, translated, and some of them in up to 40 languages, the most popular mm -hmm. ones. So suddenly, <coughs> it made the whole thing possible. So how did I do it? Okay, you go to TED, a TED choose a TED talk that you like, um, and in this case, it was a, a prize-winning one. So they have to be the most popular ones. There's a new one that looks really interesting about lessons we've learned from death row. And uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> great. And I thought, oh yeah, students will love that one. <laughs> But there's, no, there's not even a transcript for that yet. I guess that's on its way. Um, but uh, So it doesn't work with all of them. But what you can do is um, go to the interactive transcripts, OK? And then if you click this button here... Sorry, by the way, this interactive transcript... You notice that that word there is highlighted. So the, way, well, the reason it's interactive is because if you hit that, the video will go immediately to that point so that the students can hear it. So it's quite a nice tool for them to use. But, um, so, uh, yeah, you click there and you get all the different languages. And that's not all of them, you know, it's only going up to C. But that's, that's quite a lot there. And then you'll see them. So that's oh, Chinese. Yeah. Now, the thing to be aware of is that if you're going to choose a bit from the middle of it, you've got to count how many paragraphs there are. Mm. But that's not difficult. I just choose the first paragraph. Make your life a bit easier. Um, Sorry, Andrew, but it, but it, you've got the interactive thing, so if you press on there, that will take you to where it is in the... Anyway, do you see what I mean? So even if you click oh, yeah. on that in the translation, it will jump to the place where you are. Yeah. 
yeah. <laughs> where you want to be. So yeah. that works, yeah. So that does work, to, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. they're subtitles too. So you can get the subtitles in all different languages too. So I guess there's lots of other ideas. I'm just going to show, how is it possible? Do you know how well translated this is? Well, they're translated by volunteers. Right. But, um, I mean, I spoke to my wife about it. She was really excited. And I, she reckons that there probably are people who are studying translation. And, um, yeah, the Korean is quite formal. Right. And the, so is the German. So that's the only niche in the I've had. Right. And there was a little box on the website. There's a little box on the bottom that says, do you want to volunteer to become, do you want to become a, a TED translator? Yeah. And so um, presumably there is some kind of quality control or some kind of thing you have to yeah. go through to become mm -hmm. it. And the, given the nature of its exclusivity and everything else, yeah, it's so well, it's just random, it's not just uploaded. So. But, um, yeah, so, and, and also, because there are two languages that I couldn't find, Danish and Bengali, right, for, for my particular class, so I put those through Google Translate, and, uh, and I know that's dangerous, uh, but Google Translate did fine with the Danish, she said, oh, it's completely workable, and when she described why, why bits of it she thought were nonsensical, I thought, well, actually, when you know the translation, that's fine, because it was a translation of a French person speaking English anyway. <laughs> so, uh, which is another thing I think is really exciting in the elf context. Um, the, the Bengali guy, you might have known him, Rahim, he, he said, it's unworkable, but I think he'd rather just not, not participate anyway, so I don't really know <laughs> if that's true or not. So, uh, yeah. So, copy and paste into a Word document. So, what I did is I gave each one their their paragraph. Well, I actually gave them three paragraphs, and even my advanced B, who are really good, I mean, they are the best GE students in the school, according to their level. I thought they'd work through three paragraphs, and one was easily enough, that paragraph you've just been looking at. And they all translated it into English, right, on their own. And then I got them into pairs, and they uh, negotiated a third version, if you like, a, 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 an agreed version. And it was in that stage there that I heard, this is what I got so excited about, was I heard the kind of discussion about language that I've never really been able to elicit you know, genuine discussion about the different possible meanings of this word and the different structures and why you would use that one. And, um, and uh, it was just, yeah, that was the bit where they were super, super engaged. And it was really interesting. Danny did it slightly differently. Do you want to talk about that now or later on? When you prefer. Yeah, um, I did it where they did it by themselves and then they discussed how their verses were then different from each other, so they were sort of, the, the Arabic people were saying, oh look, we can put a, we can use to be with a noun, and the others were saying, oh, we can't. And so they talked about the differences in their language. So you didn't make them write a kind of negotiated version? No, they, they, did the opposite way they talked about? They talked about, well, they, they, they've got their, they did it, they translated it, but they did it together in the nationality groups, oh, okay. and then they compared the different, they found the differences in the English version. And, and how they'd, but what the differences were in Arabic to and Korean and English, and so it was sort of the the differences in language were more interesting than the translation itself. But, but the difference were well, they were mainly focusing on the kind of form differences. Yeah, though, yeah, 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 yeah. About how the prepositions were used differently in all the different languages, and how in English they just had to learn. Okay, we just have the. You've got all of those. Because there were loads in there, loads of ones where they're just da 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 in the Portuguese and French. It's quite useful to kind of learn and train them generally to think about yeah, the languages. Yeah, I chose my text was too easy because a lot of it they already knew. So they were going, oh, yeah, I knew my prepositions were. Was this an advanced level class? Yeah, yeah. And so only a couple of things came up that were very, very revelatory for them. So that, my text was too easy. I think in my case, there was they, they, they knew the language, but the choices that they made, like for example, the, the, the title of my one was J.R., uh, which is the title of the person, the, the artist, and he said, uh, uh, use translation to turn the world inside out. And, and they all chose using translation, because it made more sense, sort of a noun phrase for this ti as a title. So using translation to turn the world inside out, that's what they chose. So we looked at why, you know, like the imperative versus the sort of noun phrase thing. And um, yeah, it was that kind of discussion that, that I got. Very Mine was a narrative structure. 
so that it was fairly easy to put back into a narrative structure, I think. So. But I think even so, like I guess the point is, is that they knew those structures, but the, the use of and the choice they had uh, was interesting for them to discuss. So, um, <coughs> uh, yeah, so basically that was it. Oh, no, that's right. And the last part, so then the, I, read, I read out the original and they had to say stop where there was a difference and we discussed if their, exception, if their version was acceptable. And, you know, and differences, um, the, you know, we just talked about the differences, you know, if it impacted on focus or emphasis and things like that. Okay, um, I think that's that. Um, what topic have we chosen? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I suppose. What did you say? That's quite interesting. Like modified form of yeah. Yeah. So the results um, were, uh, they were really engaged, um, hmm. all the things that I've just said. Things that you know, they talked about, talked about things like metaphors, and oh, in my language we say, oh, no, 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 no. so there was interest between sort of across the languages as well as just about English. Um, and these are some of the advantages that um, came up. Uh, yeah. um, Liam did it as well, and. Uh, said these things. Take a moment to read them. Are oh, they a direct quote? Okay, this is a high level stuff. No, this was study skills me. Mm. He chose a different he didn't <coughs> say one, he, we all did different TED talks. Yeah. But he chose his according to the level. Um, that's it. Oh, yes. And Jess has done it yet. Have you? You're, you're, you're going you're gonna to do it too. I'm going to do it too. I didn't do it because Dan and I were sharing with the students. That's what the students have said, but now I can actually do it. But it was a technique, wasn't it, that was overlapped, not the text. Mm -hmm. It was a different, different text. Yes. Yeah. But we thought it was a bit much for one week to do it, you know, for two days on the trial. But also on the tent. Yeah, bash the weather in the tent. Science really worked really well with this as well. Okay. Right. Because if you go into there's a search for about half an hour or all the different possible things where you could find you know like the same text in many different languages and we couldn't find anything so it's almost like TED talks have enabled this thing that was previously mm -hmm. impossible except for <laughs> song lyrics and well, Wikipedia yeah. And Wikipedia, I mean, I don't know how accurate it is. Wikipedia? But you've got yeah. all the languages down the side, and you can translate it into simple English, you know, yeah. for low levels. Um, yeah. So you, yeah, that's true, actually. You could have the simple English, and then the, also the version in their language. Or something. Is there a simple English version? Yeah, well? yeah. No, not of everything, but of quite a lot of popular yeah. entries, yeah. Great, so I've got more out of this TV session than you know. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. And, uh, Anne, you... Yeah, no, I've, said, uh, um, I've used it with lower levels, so it's kind of going the other way around. So, like... Uh, really originally to, to get to support their um, listening, so getting them to read the translation first and then looking at uh, the actual TED talk 
and, and then going back to the translation, and, you know, doing that a few times until they felt more comfortable with what was actually being said in English without actually having to look at the English version. Um, and then, uh, you know, and I had recently started developing from that just because you know, these things happen, don't they? Because it's like white rice or something. But um, uh, get, then getting them back to go back to their language and begin to try and reconstruct the text. So in other words, so then really a bit like a dictagloss, like a mm. supported and modified dictagloss, you know. And then going back and comparing what they've written with what they hear, so and uh, the saying it works at low level. That by you're sort of processing the text for meaning, meaning you're using absolutely. The translation, and so they can just focus on form later once they've got the meaning. Yeah, form and sort of lexis. Yeah. Okay. So in, yeah. So it's really kind of meaning first, and then form and meaning. So, and, but I say, because when Andy was talking about it, I was saying, you know, I've really, really done it at the high level. I was like, oh, gosh, that's exactly what I do with low levels, but I just start with their language, you know. Lovely. Mm, lovely point. Absolutely. That one of the issues I always think with private teaching writing is to try and encourage students to move away from formulating sentences in their own language, in their head, and then trying to translate those into English and put these on the paper. And isn't this going to just encourage that problem or, or exacerbate that problem? Because actually, often we want students to formulate sentences in English in their head and try and write those on paper and then work with them. Yeah. But maybe by giving this, this bit added, but sorry, I'm just back in there. Um, it's quite hard to go for it to stop doing one. I think you're right, but it's quite hard to not translate if you're a student, isn't it? Yeah. Writing. So if you get the translation, so in effect, to translate. No, no, but in effect, then, instead of like being quite extreme about it, yeah. using it as stepping stones mm. and supporting them, letting them do it, and, and with a task to it, so that they're looking for something particular and getting something out of it. So you were saying that they were noticing the differences. And they noticed the flaws as well. They noticed yeah, the flaws. They and then it builds, up their, their, builds up their confidence to help them to get to a point where they won't need to do that as much. But I think rather than bashing them on the head and saying you can't do it, maybe we should just go with it and see mm -hmm. how we can guide it. Alistair, in mine, the Arabic lot came up with um, I'm rarely being attention. Right. And and we were sort of talk about that you know, the B plus now can be done in Arabic, and she said, oh, that's why I always write it then. Mm. Uh, and so yeah. she's got this mm. right. knowledge now to take into her writing. Right. And yeah. Yeah. It's a bit like looking behind the scenes, isn't it? Yeah. 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 You can understand yeah. that the English language has a different kind of flavour. Yeah. So that makes it perhaps easier to sort of impose that English character, English personality onto yourself as the language, I mean, not, you know, not literally. But um, to be able to get into that headspace when you do write it, to understand that you do need to change gear by going mm. back to a different gear to explore it. Mm. I think there's a couple of things. That one is, there are, you know, people learn in all sorts of different ways. Sure. Um, and I, I sort of preceded my lesson with a, a little talk about translation and how we never do this and you know why we should do it because it's completely unnecessary. <laughs> and uh, a bit undermining, actually, because uh, one of them started to say, well, we're, we're encouraged not to translate, aren't we? We're encouraged. And I said, well, no, fine. Um, of course, I'm not suggesting that you start when you're speaking, start sort of like using this as a... I said, but as an activity to do, to raise awareness, to learn new vocabulary and all these things, um, I think it's, it's valid and so does... You know, no, I'm, I'm not asking these questions because I don't... I don't no, no. Think that, but I think, yeah, but I think there needs to be some caution with yeah. using this because yeah, the whole reason that the translation was taboo was really as a reaction to grammar translations and grammar teaching. And it, it, it's like the pendulum swung the other way. And yeah. yes, swinging it back is fine, but yeah. not too far. No, but uh, yeah, like I so said, I think there's like, if you're, if you're, if you're a, I don't think there's any suggestion that they're, that they're no, encouraging yeah. them to. So, I mean, by, by doing it from TED Talks, it's clearly not written difficult, isn't it? I suppose it's yeah. one thing, as long as yeah. you're emphasising sure. to the students that what we're doing is reconstructing speech, you know, yeah. something completely different from the writing skill is one thing. And the other thing is, well, actually, one thing we could do, and one thing I'm, you know, when I'm doing it at low levels, I'm not necessarily getting them to write it down. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm using a smaller chunk and just trying to get them to work it out, and they're doing it orally, you know. So I think, you know, you can sort of put some caveats on it and then maybe use it as a for speaking development or, you know, and you've still got the same thing. So what did you say? What did he say? Why is it different? So it doesn't have to be written. Yeah, no, I just think it's going to be great. And um, TED Talks have enabled this and uh, I just wanted to share. So uh, <laughs> yeah. in the spirit of TED Talks, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> so anyway,
yeah, that's it. If no one's got anything else. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go now and read the cat.